name is Mickey Basil. I'm the choir director here, and along with uh, my wife, uh, Beth, uh, we handle the children's ministry. And once in a while, I get the awesome privilege, honor, to get up in this pulpit and share Jesus with a lot of people that I really care a lot about. Thanks, Brother Jeff, for this opportunity. <clears throat> a lot of Basils here in Union County. Um, I tell this story when I, my wife and I married, we moved to Dallas, Texas, if you ever been to Dallas, the white pages is about that thick. Not a single basil in the whole Fort Worth, Dallas metroplex. Moved back to Union County where the phone book's about like that, and there's 10 or 12 of us. Some say I'm the best basil of the bunch. I say the bar is not that high. Hope you guys are having a great Labor Day weekend. Hope to see you tonight at the fairgrounds where we will have fish, fun, fellowship, fireworks, free at the fairgrounds. How about all those Fs? They ought to be able to remember that, right? <clears throat> As Brother Jeff said, over the next eight weeks or so, we're going to focus on unity and how important it is in our families, in our work relationships, our marriages, and especially in our church. He said he preached a sermon series last year on unity, U-N-I-T-Y. The U is unity in the community. N is never stop encouraging other people. I is intimacy with Christ initiates unity with others. T is teamwork. And as he said, Y sometimes the hardest is yielding to others to promote unity. You've done that before. You've probably been in a meeting and somebody asked for some ideas and you had an idea, but somebody that normally doesn't talk a whole lot shared an idea that they had. Of course, it wasn't as good as your idea because it's your idea, but you kept your mouth shut and you promoted unity right there by yielding. So that's what we're going to talk about over the next eight weeks or so. I've titled this sermon this morning, Three Ways to Be in One Accord. Today I want to talk about unity and how we as a church can all be in one accord. What is unity? Well, I can tell you what unity is not. 100 years of Christian fellowship, unity, and community outreach ended last Tuesday in an act of congregational discord. Holy Creek Baptist Church was split into multiple factions. The source of dissension is a piano bench, which still sits beside the 1923 Steinway piano to the left of the pulpit. Members and friends at Holy Creek Baptist say that the old bench was always a source of hostility. People should have seen this coming. At the present, Holy Creek congregation will be having four services each Sunday. There's been an agreement mediated by an outside pastor so that each faction will have its own separate service with its own separate pastor. Since the head pastor is not speaking to the associate pastors, each will have their own services, which will be attended by faction members. The services are far enough apart that neither group will come into contact with each other. An outside party will be moving the piano bench to different locations and appropriate positions between services so as to please both sides and to avoid any further conflict that could result in violence. Let me ask you a question. How can you get your mind right to worship Jesus Christ in church when you're worried about where the piano bench is sitting? This is what unity is. Another story for you. A number of years in Canada, a little two-year-old girl wandered away from her neighborhood. It was a cold winter's day. Her parents alerted the neighbors and they saw some tracks in the snow, but there were a lot of other tracks, so for several hours the searchers went in all different directions calling her name. They did not find her. A little before sunset, one of the men said, instead of all working separately, let's join hands and form a long line and walk through this field together. That way we can't miss a single foot. So that's what they did. They joined hands and together walked as one long line calling the little girl's name. Tragically, they found her frozen body curled up. One of the men said with great anguish, Oh, if we had only joined hands earlier. That's what unity is. Webster's define unity, uh, defines unity like this. The state or quality of being one, singleness. The state or quality of being in accord, harmony. 
the combination or arrangements of parts into a whole, unification. The Bible has some great verses on unity. Psalm 133.1, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. Romans 6.5, if we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, I appeal to you brothers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. Let's stand as we read our scripture lesson this morning. It comes from the book of Acts. We're going to look at chapter 2 and we're going to look at the verses 43 through 47. Just a little background for you. Peter has been preaching. Yeah, that same Peter that denied Jesus three times. And it says earlier that he had been preaching and those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 people were saved. There's some revival going on there. So here we are reading about one of the first churches. Let me tell you guys, this church was all in. It was all in. Acts 2, 43 through 47. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had any need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Today we might say that they studied the scriptures, shared one another's lives, broke bread at both in refreshment and in the Lord's Supper and prayed together. As I said, this church body was all in. Scripture mentions several times that they ate together. Sharing meals played an important part in the early church. Hopefully, as they discovered, and we will tonight, the first rule of church growth is, if you feed them, they will come. This church was not a building, though. This was so great about it. It was wherever the believers were in the temple court, in the homes, in the tents, and at the fairgrounds tonight. The church is where the believers hang out. You see, a healthy Christian community attracts people to Jesus Christ. The Jerusalem's church zeal for worship and brotherly love was contagious. A healthy, loving church will grow in numbers. What are we doing at Bethlehem United Methodist Church to make our church the kind of place that will attract others to Jesus Christ? Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this day, the many blessings of life. Lord, we thank you for this church. Lord, we thank you for the people here today. And Lord, I pray for the people that are traveling this weekend. Lord, I just pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, will be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. How do we, as Bethlehem United Methodist Church, duplicate this church that we just read about. I believe the first thing that we need to do is we need to have a purpose. Why do we do what we do? At Bethlehem, we have a purpose. We have a mission statement that we should all know by now. It's to lead people into a decision for Jesus and to disciple them for life. At the Church of Acts, it was the very same thing. To do whatever it took to bring people into the arms of our loving Savior. As for being in one accord, God's family works best when its members work together. I can think of no better illustration uh, than tug-of-war, a game that we play in Awana, where all the teams, both teams, have to be pulling in the same direction on that rope to be successful. i tell you another place that being on the same page is pretty important, and that's canoeing on the Buffalo National River in Arkansas. If you are not in one accord in a canoe, bad things can happen. Went to the Buffalo on a uh, youth trip, and as the guy was putting us into the uh, river, he said, guys, you ought to be okay. The river's a little high, 
just watch out for horseshoe bend. We didn't even know what he was talking about. I tried to find a picture of horseshoe bend. I couldn't find one. Now, this is, this is what it looked like when we got into the water right here. Horseshoe bend, the river's running this way, and then all of a sudden it turns back this way. There's a rock, and there's a tree, and there's a little, little place that the canoe can go through there. Okay, that's horseshoe bend. So there's got to be a lot of communication going on between the guy in the back of the canoe, who's kind of rowing back there, and the guy in the front kind of looking out for things. Well, I remember as Bill Smallwood and I approached the bend, the water started bubbling and looking white, kind of like that. I'm going to be honest with you. A little panic was setting in with me. As for being communication, as far as the communication with Bill and I, I just remember a lot of yelling and screaming going up. <laughs> the next thing I know is our canoe slams into the side of that tree. And the next thing I know is I'm coming up out of the water. Now, President Obama may have been cold this week in Alaska, but I can assure you he wasn't as cold as I was when I came up out of that water. That's the coldest water I've ever seen. It absolutely took my breath away. But you know something? I wasn't worried about every stitch of clothes that I had was wet. That didn't bother me. I wasn't even concerned that we may have torn that canoe up hitting that tree as hard as we did. I was mostly concerned about seeing my lunch float down the Buffalo River in a bag. Don't judge me. Those barbecue vine of sausages are pretty good. It's important to have unity. Our scripture that we read earlier is exactly how we know that the Bible is true and that Jesus is alive. Remember at Jesus' death, the disciples scattered. They were disillusioned. They feared for their lives. But after seeing the resurrected Christ, they were fearless. They risked everything to spread the good news around him, about him around the world. They faced imprisonment, beatings, rejection, martyrdom, yet they never compromised their mission. They had a purpose, and his name was Jesus Christ. In addition to a purpose, we must have a belief in what we're hearing. The disciples believed, you see, they're not going to die for a lie. No matter who is talking to us, whether it's our preacher, our boss, our coach, we will not be successful if you don't believe in the message that you're hearing. When I was playing football at W.P. Daniel High School my sophomore and junior year, there's no way to say it. We were not very good. We won two games my sophomore year and one game my junior year. But in my senior year, we had a new coach that came on the scene, a guy on the top left there, Coach Ben Jones, just turned 85 years old. He was, he's been a winner at every stop that he stopped at. Everywhere he was a coach, he was an awesome coach. He told us, he said, you boys are close. You just need some better direction. His coaching staff believed in us. Coach Jones was a motivator. By the way, that guy in the middle, top, top middle, is a pretty good-looking guy. He got a lot of hair. <laughs> I don't remember all that hair, but anyway. We were about to play Aberdeen. And uh, we had gone out, and we came back in, and the Aberdeen boys had some boom boxes that they had. I know... I'm dating myself here. There wasn't any such thing as an iPhone or iPad or anything like that. It was a boom box that you had to carry on your shoulder. And they were listening to the music so loud that we could actually hear the music in our dressing room. We were trying to get ready for the game. We were trying to get serious. Like I say, Coach Jones was a motivator, and he handed out some letters to us. Those letters were actually written by our mothers. And, and the boys that didn't have letters or didn't have mothers, their aunts or their grandmothers wrote them a letter. Those letters told, them, told us how proud of us that they were and, and, and how much that they loved us. <clears throat> As we were about to go on the field, a lot, very emotional, very emotional in, in the dressing room. 
And as we're going out on the field, we're about to break through the cheerleader's poster. I turned around and looked at the meanest, looked into the face of the meanest man I've ever been around, Johnny Jones, the guy to the right in the second section right there. There's big old tears rolling down his eyes right there. I knew right then and boys from Aberdeen better put them boom boxes back up because it's going to be bad for them that night. <laughs> I actually heard this week that Robert Parks, who was our manager, was walking onto the field with Coach Jones that night, and one of the fans from Aberdeen came up to him and said, Coach, you think you boys can even play with us? And Robert said, Coach Jones, we were both undefeated in the conference at the time. And uh, Coach Jones, uh, Robert said, Coach Jones looked at him in the face and says, I don't even think you boys going to score on us tonight. We ended up winning 23 to nothing that night. <clears throat> I say that to say this. Again, if you don't believe in the message, you will not be successful. If we didn't believe in Coach Jones' message when he came to New Albany, there would have been no way that we went from 1-9 and nine to 10-2 and two and win, won the overall Little Ten Championship. We believed in what he was saying. Most of us have been in on some church business meetings. A story is told about a small country church where the pastor called a special meeting of the congregation to approve the purchase of a brand new chandelier. After some discussions pro and con, an old farmer stood up, and he said, buying a chandelier may seem like a good idea to you, but I'm against it for three reasons. First of all, it's too expensive, and we can't afford one. Second, there isn't anybody around here who really knows how to play one. And third, what we really need in this church is a new light fixture. <laughs> the farmer did not believe. To be successful... You've got to have a purpose. Second thing, you've got to believe in the message. And you must have a desire to carry it out. They praise God and enjoy the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their numbers daily who were being saved. If you don't have a desire to do something, you won't do it. If you're trying to lose weight and you don't have a desire to do it, you're not going to do it. There are many examples in Scripture of men that had a great desire to do the right thing. King David comes to mind. In 2 Samuel 7, David desired to build God a dwelling place, a permanent dwelling place. This was a good desire, and God praised him for having that dream. This was a glorious desire because he desired not to receive anything from God. He just wanted to give something back to God who had given him everything. This was a godly desire because he had no ulterior motives in building God a house. He just wanted the Lord God glorified and honored. You and I were created for community. That's why our topic this morning is so important. You were made to have intimate relationships, to serve people lavishly, to share the stuff that you've got to build into the lives of the people around you, to have people to whom you can entrust the secrets of your heart and to laugh, to praise, to pray, and to cry with other human beings. As the musicians come back forward this morning, as a church, we probably feel it would be so much easier if we could be like old Lucy in the old Peanuts cartoon. Lucy says to Charlie Brown, I would have made a great evangelist. Charlie Brown answered, is that so? She said, yes, I convinced that boy in front of me in school that my religion is better than his religion. Charlie Brown asked, well, how did you do that? Lucy said, well, I hit him over the head with my lunchbox. We don't need to hit anybody over the head with a lunchbox. We just need to be a loving, giving, forgiving church, and I believe that we are. I challenge you today. Whatever job you have on our church team, always give 110%. Don't worry about who gets the credit and make sure that God gets the glory. As we sing our final song today, the altar is always open for prayer. 
Maybe you would like to give your heart to Jesus Christ this morning. That'd be a great thing. Maybe you'd like to join our fellowship here at Bethlehem United Methodist Church. We would love to have you. Brother Jeff will be waiting on you right here.